Hello everyone, it's Thursday, August 22nd. I'm sorry I was a little late here and everything. Road construction all over the place. That's good stuff and everything, but uh, we've got several things to go through, and then I know you got a bunch of questions, so I'm going to go through them pretty quickly, but uh, neat stuff that's going on at the Cass Railroad area and everything, and uh, Lost River and all that that's, uh, that's happening all around us and everything, but, uh, but what I mean by that is a uh, hundred more brand new campsites at Cass and 35 more at Lost River, $12.8 million that, we've, uh, that we're announcing that we're going to do that project there at their campground at uh, both places. And so all kinds of good stuff. Brett, you come on and talk to us about that, please. Well, thank you, Governor, and good afternoon. It sure is good to be here again, and what another historic day under your leadership. Yes, we have two new campgrounds for the West Virginia State Park System. Cass Scenic Railroad State Park and Lost River State Park both have been awarded construction contracts for these projects to begin. The new campground at Cass will be located on that beautiful Greenbrier River and next to the Greenbrier Rail Trail in Pocahontas County, and it'll be in walking distance to the company store, which houses the gift shop, Shay's Restaurant and a Soda Fountain. The park also features an artisan shop and the Cass Historical Theater and Museum, which is one of the only ones in America at this time, and we're also, of course, close to the train depot, which we get to be really proud of that Shea system that we have up there. The campground is actually going to be located on the site of the old Deer Creek extract plant, which played a really pivotal role in the uh, World War I by extracting tannins from some of the there. trees in that area to uh, dye the uniforms, which is a pretty cool piece of history. And the good news, Governor, I know a lot of those facilities have deteriorated, but we're going to be able to uh, sign and interpret a bunch of these, these old remnants so folks that come to visit the area will understand some of the deep and rich history of Cass. The campground at Lost River is going to be nestled deep in those mountains in Hardy County and what beautiful secluded opportunities this is going to provide our guests to, to come into these 35 modern sites that will have water and 50 amp hookups and they will be both modern campgrounds with all the, the necessities and items that our campers of today are expecting. Many of our sites in the park system were built back in the 60s and 70s and don't accommodate some of these newer units but these will thanks to your, to your investment into our park system. We've also been able this time to utilize all West Virginia companies again. We've worked with Ghosh Architecture, Montem Architecture, Wolf's Excavating, and, oh, I'm forgetting the other one now, um, High Point Construction in, in Buckhannon. So we're really proud to keep these dollars right here in state and increase our tourism opportunities. And speaking of tourism, Governor, I do want to give a shout out to the Department of Tourism. Chelsea Ruby and his, her team have been phenomenal through this process and many others with our state park system. They are partners that we could not make it without. And lastly, Governor, I just want to thank you again for your support in the park system, belief in our state, and the ability that you've given us to further these opportunities for the residents and guests of our great state. So, Governor, I can't thank you enough for everything you've invested into our park system. Well, Brett, thank you, and thank all the folks and everything that are... And, CJ, I think we've lost a picture in here. Y'all forgive us. We've got some technical issues here. Okay. Rebecca. Get Brian. We cleared the wait list, didn't we? Not completely. No, we had the four.
All right, Governor, we're good. Okay, here we go again. Uh, of just about everything that we have today, this one, this one, I am probably the most proud of, and uh, and 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 this, you know. So, so let me just read to you a little bit. Well, let me first of all go back. You know, when I got here. We had a terrible wait list on IDD, and it took a little while, but we completely cleared the wait list. Now, we got a new one now, and so we've got some folks that are on this new, new wait list that we have now, and a goal absolutely before I walk out the door is to clear the wait list again. Now. But today, I'm really excited to announce just this, that we are increasing our provider waiver rates by 15% starting October the 1st. Now, a lot of people thought, well, gosh, you know, there's no way, you can't find any money, you can't do this and that and everything. But we really worked really, really hard at this. We got the money, and... Uh, a lot of people, you know, working, pulling the rope together. And so with all that being said, we can get so, some more bucks to these great people that are absolutely doing God's work. And so with all that being said, I'm just tickled to death to do that. And, uh, and I know that uh, that's your prayers and mine too. And so a lot of good people doing a lot of great work there. From a standpoint of child care, you know, when we come together... You know, for our special session and everything, we've got to pass that credit. But we've also found enough federal funds to cover the cost of our centers, you know, with entirety till the end of the year. And so with all that being said, you know, everybody's running around all over the place saying, we've got child care centers that are folding up right and left, and we're not going to have child care and this and that. And a lot of it is unfounded. But with all that being said, we've got funding. We can do it. You know, our legislature knows we have the, the dollars. And what we've got to do is just, uh, is just make sure that we improve child care. Absolutely improve child care because that's what drives young people to this, to this great state. And we've got to have workers. That's all there is to it. And young people have children. But young people are, are our workers. So anyway, all that being said, uh, more good stuff on the way for our child care providers and absolutely great stuff on the way, you know, for our, uh, our folks in, 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 you know, that are involved with a, uh, IDD. Okay, you know about this, and there's no point in me spending a lot of time with this and everything, but uh, an additional 4% tax cut is on the way. And I'm very, very hopeful that the legislature will do an additional five. And, uh, you know, we've, we've done a lot of good stuff there and everything, but we want to keep trying to put as much money back in the hands of our people as we possibly can. Now, this is way off the, off the beaten path and everything, but we've got a fellow that's with us today. His name is Theo Mihalis, and Theo is a two-time now, second time in a row, he is a national champion as far as the trick shots in billiards. And so Theo is going to show us one of his trick shots. And so, Theo, you take it from here. Ladies and Justice, how are you doing this morning? I'm good. How are you doing, sir? Doing great. Doing great. So my name is Theo Mahalis. For those who don't know, I'm from Fallonsby, West Virginia. I'm 20 years old, and I'm a tr pool trick shot player. I'm now the current rank number six in the world, and we're just looking to keep going up from here. So I'll start walking you through some of my the achievements I've been through my career. So I guess we'll start. I'm a four-time Guinness World Record holder for the highest jump pot of a billiard ball. So pretty much what that means is we have a cue ball at this end, a massive bar in the middle. You jump it from one end of the table over and sink it into the other end. So... I had to break this four times against the guy who lives in Las Vegas and is considered probably the greatest of all time in our sport. So it's super cool to be able to go against the best. But we'll start here. 
So this was back in 2018. I said the first time in Dormont, Pennsylvania. It was awesome because I got this the first time I was able to compete. I was able to do it in front of all my friends and family. There's probably over 50 people that showed up. And I made the shot on my first try. I didn't know what to expect of it, but I got it first and everybody went nuts. And that was probably one of the coolest things I've ever done. And then he went back, he broke it. So then I had to go back and break it second time in uh, Parkersburg, West Virginia. That time was at 25 inches. And then broke it, he broke it again. And this time I had to go to Rome, Italy. They had a Guinness World Records show. There was over 40,000 record holders in their book and they only chose 20 people to fly out to do a live shot. And I was one of the chosen people, which I thought was super cool. So we flew the whole way over to Rome, Italy. I got to shoot on their live TV show and I broke the record. I only had three attempts to make it, which to be quite honest, was kind of a suicide mission trying it, but I never turned down the opportunity, went for it and I got it. Coolest, probably one of the coolest things I've done in my whole life. And then he had to go break it again. So then we move on to the last time I broke it, which was also in Parkersburg, West Virginia, which at that time it was 31 inches high. So you can imagine having to jump one cue ball over 30 inch, inch bar. It's pretty impressive. It's not too easy. And now I've held that record for over four years now, which is, I think we, I think we locked it down, hopefully at least. So then we'll move on to some of my tournament accomplishments. So starting over here, we have, so back in 2020 when COVID had us all locked down, we as the pool players decided we're not going to let this stop us when we're just going to we're going to have a tournament we'll do it online so i started this and i won the online shootout between a couple guys which was super cool because we were one of the first people to uh, host like a sporting event online even during the lockdown and then we moved to here the u.s national artistic pool championships i placed third in this one but um it was a super close match in my semifinals with the now current number one ranked player in the world. It was a back and forth battle, but uh, I didn't, didn't come out on top on that one, but just used it as a learning experience. Then we move on to the next year. I learned, got better. And on two days notice, I was sitting at Bravo's with my mom and my grandma, and I decided for some reason, I don't know what hit me, that I wanted to go compete. So I decided to go compete, practice for two days, and I became the Masters of National Artistic Pool Championship. And then this year, so we went, we, I've been at the same place for three years now. I placed third, then I got first. And now I defended my Masters National Artistic Pool Championship for the second time, which also, the first time I won it made history with me being the youngest person to ever win an event. And then I also made history again being the first person or the youngest person to defend and we're planning on making history for our third time next year being the first time ever to defend for three times i don't think it's ever been done before but with all the work and dedication i think we can make it happen so moving on we're kind of backtracking here but i always think this is the coolest one so i was only able to go to one world championship and this was the one so to backtrack my, I entered my first pool tournament. I came in second to last place out of, I forget how many people, but I did like horrible. Then I went to the next one. I got a little bit better, still didn't get my outcome. I lost in the first round, but then the next event was the world championships where the first round I had to play the number one ranked player at the time. I was able to get past him in a crazy, one of the craziest comebacks in pool history. And then I had to go against the ranked number four player at the time, which was a rematch who'd, who'd beat me before. So it was cool to get that bag. And then in the finals, I had to play a guy. So the funny story is, I think I also have set the record for the youngest or the biggest age gap in a finals match. The age gap, I was, I think, 14 or 15 years old at the time. The guy I was playing was about 68 years old. So there should have been like a 48 year age gap which was like crazy. I didn't get the outcome, but 
from going from second to last to second place in the world championships was like unheard of. I came in as a complete dark horse. I just planned to um, make a name for myself, and I think that's what I did. And Theo, did and you did you have a shot for the governor, Theo, that you wanted to show him? Yeah, I can show. Yeah, please do. All right. So for this, I'm going to make the yellow ball in this pocket, the orange ball in this pocket, the red in this pocket, and the pink in this pocket. All in one shot. It's like that. Really good. Really what do we good. think? What do we think? Uh, I think that's great. I think that's absolutely wonderful. And thank I, you. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, I congratulate you on everything. And we have a certificate of recognition for you for the state of West Virginia. And we're going to do that oh, right man. now. I'm going to sign it right now. And uh, I want you to just keep doing the great work you're doing. Never stop. Never stop him. All right, there you go. We'll get this to I, you. We'll get this to you. Keep doing the I great work. I appreciate it so much, Governor. Thank you now. Keep doing great stuff. Okay, we've got some transportation awards. This is for the Grant Street Bridge Project, the Wellsburg Bridge Project, and, and uh, route, uh, U.S. Route uh, 340 and the, right outside of Harper's Ferry and everything, but these are our uh, safety awards. This is a best use of technology award, and this is the, the uh, quality of life and community development awards. So we congratulate those. Like I said, our DOT continues to do great, 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 great work and very, very proud of them. We've got another student, you know, that's done Done is proud in the state of West Virginia. His name is Andrew Mateu, and uh, and Andrew is a Weir High uh, High School graduate and everything. He just was in a competition. It was the Microsoft Office Specialist World Championship, and he was the only student from the United States to bring home a medal. He got the bronze medal. A hundred and five thousand participants in, from eighty seven countries. I mean, I don't know how in the world you do anything other than be really amazed and really proud of what's happening with, with our West Virginia students. So that's really, really good. And the last thing I think, well, no, I've got a couple more. You know, there's a, and, and whether you say crappie or crappy and everything, it's up to you. But we've got uh, Lyndall Marker and Dwight uh, Priestley, and they have caught, uh, they've made record uh, history again at uh, Woodrum Lake in Jackson County by setting new records for black crappie or crappy, you know, catches the same day. Uh, Lendl reeled in a 17 inch or 17.36 inch, 2.85 pound uh, black crappie and everything. And an hour later, one hour later, Dwight Priestley caught a 17.76 inch 3.15 pound uh, crappie and everything. And, and, you know, if you've ever fished, you know, crappie are wonderful to eat, but if you've ever fished, uh, you, know, you know, a normal size would be like this, you know, and probably weigh significantly less than a pound, you know, maybe a half a pound, but we're talking about two fish that approach three pounds or greater and 17 inches in length and everything plus. That's an incredible, incredible fish. Way to go, guys. Uh, you know, we went to, we, I congratulate Kathy again. She's up to 36 dogs now, therapy dogs that have been placed in schools. The last one is uh, uh, Bose that was uh, placed, uh, you know, at, at his home at Gilmer County Elementary. Awful good stuff. Kathy keeps doing really great stuff in communities and schools and with these therapy dogs. And the last thing I've got is uh, Randall Reed Smith. He's on the road again delivering nearly a thousand, and get that right, a thousand books to elementary schools in, in Cabell County. You know, great, great work, Randall, and uh, gosh, you, what a curator you've been. 
So just keep doing good work. And that's all I've got. We'll take your questions. All right. Thank you, Governor. We'll now take questions from members of the media. First up today is Charles Young with WV News. Hi, this is Charles Young with WV News. Um, Governor, I wanted to go back to the IDD waiver stuff. Um, could you detail where we found those funds and, and the effort to get that together? And then you talked about wanting to clear the list again. Could you talk about what, what remains on the list and how much it would cost to clear it out? Thank you. Charles, I think uh, the secretary personally, you know, will probably do better, you know, with that question and everything than I, but I can tell you this, that we, we found the funds within DHHR, you know, and, uh, and, and, and from the standpoint of, uh, you know, that, that less enrollment has freed up, you know, money for higher rates, you know, that's, that's one of the, one of the, the drivers, but, uh, you know, it's, it's great news, it's fantastic news, you know, uh, you know that's child care, but, it, but it's fantastic news, you know, for the IDD folks and everything. And so, so uh, you know, Charles, I would just say just this. You know, we cleared the list one other time. And it had been that way for years and years and years and years. And here's the whole thing, you know, with a state that is flourishing and doing as well as our state's doing. No matter what we've got to do to clear the list again, we need to do it. I mean, I mean, these folks are really hurting. That's all there is to it. And they're doing, like I said earlier, God's work. And so we'll get it done. We'll get it done. I don't know exactly all the particulars and everything, and uh, Secretary personally will be able to help more with that than I can give you. But with all that being said, we'll get it done. All right, thank you, Charles. Next up is Mark Curtis with Next Star Media. Good afternoon, Governor and staffers and fellow reporters. Uh, Governor, as you know, we all, all received word today, or many of us did, that uh, the Justice Family Companies had secured some financing, some new financing, um, to keep the Greenbrier from being auctioned off next Tuesday, and there won't be a hearing tomorrow to uh, go forth with that temporary injunction that was requested. I'm wondering what if you can share with us in terms of details of what was done or who has come up with the funding to secure the Greenbrier, and how does this bode well for uh, some of the other justice family businesses? I mean, the Greenbrier is just the tip of the iceberg in, in many minds because uh, your companies face uh, other legal and financial problems. So if you could shed some light on the whole situation to the extent you can. Well, Mark, uh, you know, I want to make certain that I'm telling you accurately, but, but I'm also uh, not disclosing things that I, I, you know, I'm under confidentiality not to disclose uh, or that I can't disclose. Um, so let me just say this. You know, a lot of folks have been casting a lot of stones, have you not? And, uh, and, and I would say that uh, I don't care what anybody says in the world, you know, we had a 14-year working relationship with J.P. Morgan, and then shortly after the primary, where I was the winner, hands down, you're going to the U.S. Senate, no matter what anybody says under the sun, it makes, it made total no sense other than political. It made no sense at all, first and foremost, how you could have a 14-year relationship with a company that you had a $200 million unsecured loan, $200 million, and you paid it all the way down to where J.P. Morgan's, you know, trigger point was 9.4 million. You additionally, you paid them in addition, additionally, you paid them payments as, 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 as recent as June, you know, and all of a sudden, here you go. Here you go off in La La Land. And with all that being said, we were never called, you know, Carter Bank was never called. How can you make anything of this except what I've already told you? Now, it was tough. It was really tough because, you know, these people had a lot of leverage. And really, at the end of the day, I could have just thrown my hands up 
or better yet, my children could have just thrown their hands up and, and, and really there would, have been, there would have been carnage and devastation like you can't imagine to the great people of the Greenbrier. And we'd have been fine. But it, it, if you just step back from it and think just this, and here's the bottom line the way I see it. Those people at the Greenbrier are really good people. And they've been there a long, long time. And the anxious level was off the chart. You know, you had people that, uh, just think of the lady that, uh, that serves tea in the main, di- in main lobby. You know, maybe she's been there 52 years or 48 years or whatever it may be. And she doesn't really know what in the world's going on. And you've got, you've got some folks that have some level of leverage that we never dreamed, ever dreamed was possible. No way. So we had to work. We had to work really, really, really hard, you know, Jay and Jill, to find a way to take care of this. In the meantime, all the flame that was being fanned by a lot of different directions just made it worse, you know. So, it's, so when it's all said and done, you know, what we've done is we've, we've acquired those funds. It's going to cost our family a bunch of money. And, and, and on top of that, you know, it, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's driven exactly from what I've told you it was driven from. So, you know, that's it. That's it. So it's, uh, it's taken care of and we move forward and the Greenbrier is as whole as it can possibly be. And the Greenbrier is going to be in our family forevermore. And, uh, you know, I told you, I told you, did I not? Did I not tell you? That, but uh, why do you spend so much time, in all honesty, almost wanting us to fail? That's what I can't imagine. Why do you spend so much time wanting the Greenbrier to collapse? You know, look, I'd be fine. But all those folks that have been there forever wouldn't be fine. Why in the world do we honestly almost want failure? And then on top of that, why do we do that and and literally over and over, if it's not our business, we're trying to attract somebody or save some business, we are trying, we are throwing tens and tens of 50 million or whatever it may be at businesses to try to just help them out. So they'll just keep their jobs, whether it be 600 or 400 or whatever it may be. You're talking 2,000 jobs at the Greenbrier. We don't ask you for money, do we? We don't ask the state for money. So with all that being said, uh, everything's good in the neighborhood, but it, uh, this was really tough on Jay and Jill. All right, thank you, Mark. Next up is Brianna Haney with West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Okay, we'll try and come back. Uh, Next up is Bob Aaron with WCHS-TV, Fox 11. Governor, does the uh, refinancing arrangements that, that you guys came up with, uh, th- does that also clear away any issues that might have existed with uh, uh, the employee health care? Some questions had risen with that as to whether or not uh, some payments had been made. Uh, d- d- does this give you the financial wiggle room to, to deal with that? Or is this, are we strictly talking uh, from the announcement today about what ha- what happened regarding the uh, the pending uh, uh, courthouse auction that this seems to uh, and has, in fact, I guess, resolved. Okay, somebody's got to tell me what Bob's saying because I, I can't I can't hear you well enough, Bob. Can I try it again? Any better, Governor? If you'd try it again, but uh, but do it loud, please. Okay, uh, Governor. Um, does whatever financial arrangements you came to 
that allows you to avoid uh, the, uh, the auctioning off of the property. Does that also allow you to clear up any issues that might exist regarding uh, uh, the employee's health insurance? Okay, Bob, I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to answer as best I possibly can, okay? I don't know all the particulars about the, the, the employee's health insurance, but, but here's, here's as I, how I understand it, you know, and, and, and that's why I say, you know, when, when you start down a pathway and you get people that are scared, you know, then all of a sudden other people just start piling on and jump on and they're trying to do, they're trying to do their thing to, to, to save whatever that they have in line. Bob, now listen to me about this. There is no way that the great union employees at the Greenbrier are going to go without insurance. There is no possible way. You know, and I'll promise you to the good Lord above that insurance payments have been made and were, 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 were being made on a regular basis, just like we've done in the past in many ways. Now, you know, so, now let me, let me go one step further. And this is the part that I have the biggest problem with. Bob, when Jim Justice bought the Green Bar, what did he do, Bob? What did he do? And I don't see you reporting this, but what did Jim Justice do? Jim Justice bought the Greenbrier and the employees' benefits had been stripped to the bone. They had ratified, meaning voted, they, the unions had been in a, in a negotiation for six months plus. And they had ratified their contract with the CSX and their benefits were absolutely stripped to the bone like you can't imagine. Healthcare. Health care for the union workers at the Greenbrier Hotel was set up this way. I don't remember the exact number of hours, but Bob, if you were a union worker at the Greenbrier at the time I bought the Greenbrier, 100% ratified, here's how your health care would work. I think the number was 149 hours. But if you worked 149 hours in August, you had health care coverage in the month of October. If you did not work 149 hours in September, you had no coverage in November. None. Honestly, it was hideous to tell you the truth. They had ratified it. The CSX had worked that through and got it done and got it passed and got it ratified. When I bought the Greenbrier, they wanted me to come to Colonial Hall the next day, and I did, and I walked into Colonial Hall, you know, the, I don't know what it's called, chatterbox or whatever it's called, where, the, where all the employees eat lunch on us and, and all kinds of other things. Those were all gone. Those were all 100% gone in the union negotiation that they had ratified. So I went into Colonial Hall and announced, they announced that I had bought the Greenbrier. And you know what I did next, Bob? I called the union leadership upstairs to an office and I said, I want to restore all your benefits back to you right now. And I don't want a six month negotiation. I want to be able to do it in 45 minutes. Well, we didn't get it done in 45 minutes, but we got it done in two days. And then there was another vote, and three people voted against it. I thought they were complete crazy. But nevertheless, all that being said, when you've done that kind of stuff, for this absolutely just kind of behavior, you know, which can only lead, could have only led to more of a problem, what if, what if, we, we absolutely, at, at, you know, just threw up our hands. What would have happened to those employees? I mean, 
It's great to have health insurance, but if you don't have a job, it'd be pretty doggone tough, wouldn't it? Do you realize that Beltway, what Beltway had is they had the main Greenbrier building. They didn't have the golf courses. They didn't have a lot of the cottages, didn't have an, a lot of the amenities. They had the main Greenbrier building. But you know what else they had? They didn't even have the water tanks. They had the main Greenbrier building with no water, no parking lot. What would have happened to those union jobs? What would have happened to them? And we kept beating the drum and beating the drum and beating the drum and more people just kept just getting panicked and jumped on the bandwagon. And before you know it, you could have had devastation like you can't imagine. And you could have had that to the very best people on the planet. Now, we move forward, don't we? I promise you, without, with it all in me, we will not miss one step in regard to people's health insurance, and we'll move on down the road. I also promise you that it's not, not easy. It's not easy. Sometimes we're behind. We're trying as hard as we possibly can in every way. But, uh, but this is a good day. This is a real good day, and nobody's going to take that away from me. All right, thank you, Bob. Next up is Beth Sargent with the Gazette Mail. Hey, Governor. Thanks for taking my question. Um, regarding the Greenbrier, I know I and others reported that you felt it would work out. And, you know, I'm just going to acknowledge right here that true to your word, you said, you know, it would work out and be resolved. I think that was your word. And for now, it appears it has been. So I'm just acknowledging that. And I want to pivot, if you will, to your Senate campaign. Um, your opponent has made some remarks asking where you'll reside um, if you do win. And I was wondering if you've made that decision, you know, given some of the controversy early on in your governorship about residing at the mansion. Um, have you given that some thought and do you still feel like you're on track to win and win big as you like to say? Thank you, Governor. It's Beth, is that correct? Beth, I, I, I appreciate uh... I appreciate your fairness in your question. I really do. And you've been very, 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 very fair. Uh, Beth, now let's, honest, let's be really, really honest. You know, and, and I'm not going to be one that's going to be sit here and be braggadocious about what we've accomplished because I always say it's what we've accomplished, all of us, all of us together. We pulled the rope together through COVID. We pulled the rope together through all the different things we were doing, you know, from tourism to on and on and on to roads, everything under the sun to education, everything. You know, Beth, you know, be fair. Be really fair. Have not the accomplishments of while I've been governor been off the chart? No, they have. You know, but Beth, and a lot of people were so preoccupied with, where are you going to sleep tonight, Jim? You know, really and truly, you know, Beth, I'm not, I'm not interested in getting a gold star for perfect attendance. You know, I work every single day, all the time, 100%. Seven days a week, I work every day, 100%. And you can't accomplish what we've accomplished by just sitting on a rock somewhere. You know, Beth. We can go back and we can compare to our blue-green. But absolutely, I'll have a place in D.C., and I'll have my residence in, in, uh, at Dwyer Lane, and I'll win. I'll win going away. And I'll absolutely promise you in every way there won't be a better senator. That's all there is to it. You know, now, if, if we're going to be preoccupied with... Uh, where Jim sleeps versus what Jim gets done, more power to you, more power to you, you know. And, uh, and so if my opponent doesn't have anything better to say in life, I would only just say, judge me by my deeds. Judge me by what we've gotten done. Judge me by the fact that West Virginia is absolutely killing it now. You know, 
Toby and Edith know. They absolutely know. And I'll always be working for them with all in me. And you know what else I'll do, Beth? I'll never, ever, ever be doing something for me. That's the big time difference, isn't it, Beth? Everybody else did something for them. You know, I'll promise you the magnitude of the dollars that I have lost being your governor is so off the chart, it's unbelievable. But I did it because I stepped up to serve. The magnitude of dollars that others, when they have left this office, have become very wealthy in many cases. Not me. Not me. I'm not going to do that. All right, thank you, Beth. Next up is Amelia Nicely with West Virginia Watch. Hi, Governor. Good to see you today. I want to circle back to the Medicaid rate uh, reimbursement increase. You had mentioned IDD, but we were um, in that uh, Medicaid rate study that lawmakers were talking about this year. It also had suggested rate increases for the aged and disabled waiver and also the traumatic brain injury waiver. Are those also going to see a 15% increase? Can you provide any information about those waiver programs? Amelia, I I'm sorry, Amelia. Uh, That's okay. Uh, Amelia, you know, on, on this one, you know, you're going to have to give me a pass because I, I, I feel absolutely certain the answer is yes, but I want to confirm with uh, Secretary Persley, but Amelia, I, I, I do know the answer is yes, but, uh, but I just want to make absolutely certain. All right. Thank you, Amelia. Next up is Leah Willingham with the Associated Press. Hi, Governor. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, you've always emphasized to press at these briefings that transparency is important to you and that you'll answer honestly um, any questions we ask to the best of your ability. And that's very appreciated. Um, Brad McElhenney, a long uh, time respected journalist in this state, has been doing some reporting on financial issues related to your businesses based largely on public court filings. Um, he requested to be here today and he was denied that opportunity. Um, why is that? Was he asking questions you didn't like, reporting stories you didn't like? because from our side of things, um, that's how it comes off. If that's not true, I would love for you to clarify that. And, and her name again? Okay, could, I'm sorry, forgive me, I'm, I'm horrible on names. Uh, is this Leah, is that correct, or Lee? Is it Leah? Okay, uh, uh, Leah, let me tell you this, and. And this could just be, uh, you know, an oversight on, on, on our communications people. You know, the last time I was here at the briefing, I, and maybe even the time before that, I said, you know, if, if, if you know, I'm good with Brad being back on. You know, uh, I, I'm, I, am not, I am not concerned or afraid of, of Brad's uh, negativism and everything. The only thing I would say is just this, Lee, and here's, here's all there is to it. When you absolutely, you know, have someone that basically is purposefully just continually trying to drag up something and say, you know, I know you should have gotten baby dog eight nuggets instead of, you know, seven. You know, and, and, and make some story about it and really and truly then what it comes out to be is nothing but fake news. Why in the world would you just continue to just do it and do it and do it and do it? Now, you know, if Brad were really fair, you know, he would tell you just this. And, and I, you know, we reached out. We reached out to Hoppy and said, we've got to stop this. You know, not that we have to stop you know, fair questioning and everything, but we've got to stop the vow. That's all there is to it. We, we've got too many good things that are going on in the state of West Virginia to deal with just purposeful vow. 
I'm not going to do that, Leah. I'm not going to do that at all. We reached out and said, Hoppy, for God's sakes of living, you know, we don't, we don't, want, we don't want the deck stacked in our favor. No way. I'll answer any question. That's why I'm here with you right now. I'll answer any question. I'll be tickled to death for Brad to be right back on here. But literally, all I would say to you is if someone is purposefully trying to hurt you, someone is, for whatever the reason may be, because if Brad were fair, he would tell you every single time that I've been with Brad, I've been super respectful, you know, and, and not been negative in any way. You know, it, uh, you know, Leah, I, I don't understand what is driving the, the vowel other than some, you know, two-bit headline, you know, absolutely. And I, I don't have time for that. I just don't have time for it. And uh, so we'll have Brad back, you know, and, and I hope that Brad will be just fair. That's all. You know, if there's something that uh, where I've misstepped and, and there's something that, uh, that uh, y'all want to get after me on, I'm okay. I'm good with that. But, uh, but I would expect you just to not, just not be one way or the other. I don't think it's fair for you to be super positive, super positive, super positive. I don't think that's fair either because I don't walk on water. For crying out loud, I make plenty of mistakes. All right, thank you, Leah. Next up is Curtis Johnson with WSAZ. Good afternoon, Governor. Thanks so much for having us on here. Um, you know, just uh, following up on a question earlier today, I just want to make mention that we did reach out to the Justice Family Companies uh, asking about the terms of that agreement with Beltway, simply put, just trying to figure out how much money is going to be paid as part of the deal and where is that money coming from to make up the difference. But otherwise, the other question I have is every month, families across West Virginia have to pay bills. Simply put, I think many of those families wonder, why are the justice companies with such expertise continually accused of not paying their bills? Well, Curtis, I, I don't know that that's really fair. You know, the justice companies, uh, you know, I would be, again, to be brutally honest, I would tell you that uh, we've gone through our bumps, that's for sure, and, and we've gotten behind, but we've some way, somehow always caught up, and, uh, and, and you know, so... So Curtis, you know, uh, I don't really know, I don't know many businesses that don't have great times and some tough times. Now, the one thing that I have always done, and Curtis, you know, a lot of people would surely never do this, but Curtis, in great times, what have we done with our money? I mean, we've not, we've not put our money into some Cayman Islands accounts, or we've not put our money, you know, into, into the stock market and just sat back and done nothing. You know what we've done with our money, Curtis? Every single time we've reinvested our money and we've re reinvested it for the most part in West Virginia. And in doing so, we've grown and employed thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And you're talking about a guy that started with his grandparents with no indoor plumbing, and what have we done with our money? Curtis, you know, when we sold out the Russians in the very beginning, we could have been hanging out on the beach somewhere or, hang, or, or me being able to hunt and fish and do everything in the world I wanted to do with a bank account so big that you couldn't even fathom it. And what did we do, Curtis? We absolutely bought the Greenbrier out of bankruptcy, and absolutely, absolutely reinvested, 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 and reinvested. We built a casino right off the get-go, right underground. Cost $125 million. We brought in the PGA for everybody in the state of West Virginia, and it cost us $110 million plus that we lost. 
Curtis, for good or for bad, whether it was smart or dumb, you know, we have done one thing, and that is this. Every time we have done well, we have reinvested, and for the most part, we have reinvested in West Virginia. Now, sure, we stub our toe from time to time, and, uh, but we always seem to try to make it right. And so that's what, uh, and, and as far as the particulars curse, you can't possibly expect, you know, the great, the great people, whether they be, you know, whatever the company may be, that are in, in business relationships with us for us to be able to disclose things that are private in private businesses. You know, uh, I can tell you this, though, and, and I mean this with all my soul. From the standpoint of Jay and Jill, this has been really, really hard. And, and from my standpoint, what little I have been able to contribute and everything, it's been hard too. But why do we, we just glaze over and forget the fact that just the other day, we had live golf at the Greenbrier. The best golfers under the sun. We had absolute TV coverage and everything and everybody seeing just how fabulous, how unbelievably fabulous not only the Greenbrier was, but absolutely how great the state of West Virginia is. Three days, three days of incredible coverage and everything that went all over the world. Why in the world, why in the world are we continuing to just try to beat something down? You know, sure, we've got mistakes and everything, and I don't mind you reporting the mistakes, but... Uh, but I really think we ought to celebrate the good. And the last thing I'd tell you on that curse is just this, is think about this one for a second. Think about the fact that when I ran for governor the first time, the state of West Virginia had a sponsorship with the Greenbrier Classic, and that sponsorship was for $1,750,000 a year. And what they did is they took people there they wined and dined them and everything else, and they recruited, and that was their recruitment tool. I wouldn't do it. I wasn't your governor. I was just running for governor. I wouldn't take the money. And, and since that time, all the sponsorships that the state had and everything, wouldn't do it. Curtis, you know, come on. There's lots and lots and lots of good out there. All right, thank you, Curtis. Governor, we have one more. Brianna Haney got her mic fixed, and I believe she's with us to ask a question. All righty. Is that working? Perfect. Um, residents on Indian Creek still um, don't have access to clean drinking water. Many are relying on donated and crowd-funded water bottles. They'll fi they have filed a lawsuit against your mining company, Bluestone, for contaminating the creek and the sources of their drinking water. As both the owner of the mine involved in multiple lawsuits regarding the matter and as their governor, what are you planning on doing for these residents? Brianna, again, uh, let me just tell you that first of all, I can tell you in regard to the water, you know, I don't think that is Bluestone's responsibility at all. I think the lawsuits, you know, that, that pertain to this, and I think the DEP, you know, now, now don't hold me to this exactly because I don't really know. You know, this one you would have to really get into the, you know, to my son Jay and people like that and everything or the DEP or whatever, but I really feel like, you know, that at the end of the day, what I think is this is not our permits or water or whatever that's causing any level of this situation. And, uh, and, and I think that will pan, pan out as we go forward. But, uh, but if, if that was your question, I was having a hard time uh, hearing it, Brianna, but I, 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 you know, I tried to answer as best I can. And again, I, I underline, I have very limited knowledge in regard to that and everything. So, 
So, but but that's for what I for what I know, that's it. All right. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Governor. Back to you. Okay. Like I said, there's nothing more important in, in you know in what I think we've talked about today than the IDD. You know, uh, you know we you know I'm just trying to look here real quick, but uh, but you know we're all concerned about child care and we've absolutely got to have child care there's no question and uh, but but you know until you have actually uh, been with taking care of whatever you know folks that uh, the IDD folks is it, you know we're all very blessed that's all I can say so uh, nevertheless let's uh, Let's some way, somehow keep moving north. You know, we've, we've got so much good that's happened in this great state, and we want to keep that going, and that's my job. You know, I absolutely uh, have been honored beyond belief being your governor, and, uh, and I'll continue to run through the finish line until it's all over. But uh, nevertheless, I thank you for, for your love, your prayers, and, and all your kind words. Uh, the last little while has been really difficult because you know we got we got put in a spot that gracious goodness you talk about something coming out of left field we really didn't expect this one and, and like I said I do believe no matter what anybody in the world will ever tell me it's awfully coincidental that we go 14 years we pay down a loan from 200 million all the way down to 9.4 million and absolutely never called and nor Carter Bank never called. And then out of the clear blue sky right after the primary is over, right after that, this all starts. You know, uh, it's awfully, awfully coincidental to me. But uh, nevertheless, we move forward. It's all I know to do. One thing we've done is we have, we've in our own way, we've saved the Greenbrier again. And that makes me real happy. And so we're going, to keep, we're going to keep doing good stuff, and there's great days. And you mark it down. Jim Justice is telling you right now, there's great days in front of the Greenbrier. Wait and see. Thank you so much.